Well, here's our last section of the thermochemistry chapter, and we're now to dissolving. Now, you thought you knew everything there was to know about dissolving, but th there's a lot going on energetically to dissolving. When substances dissolve, bonds are broken and those and made. And depending upon the substance, whether they're ionic or covalent, um, there's different energetics that go along with it. So we're going to be covering dissolving in right now and Try to think about how things dissolve. I can't show videos and, and have this make a video of a video, but this video, and I'll show it to you in class, has to do with the dissolving of sodium chloride in water. And when that happens, there's bonds that are broken between the sodium and the chlorides, and then water comes along and makes bonds to sodium and chloride. So remember that from chapter four, now there's certain energetics that are associated with that, and that's what we're going to be doing in this section. So what we're going to name this is the enthalpy of solution, because when solutes dissolve in solvent, there can be heat generated or absorbed. Now, when that happens, the enthalpy is hard to determine of the individuals, but you can measure the enthalpy of solution. And to measure the enthalpy of solution, really all you have to do is put a thermometer down in there and dissolve some of your solvent, solute in the solvent and see what happens. Now, when this, and then you could use, remember, Q equals MS delta D. If you're dissolving it in water, of course, water would be your solvent, so you would use S there for water, M for water. You would get a change in temperature, and then it would tell you how much energy was exchanged. And then you could de determine that in joules, and then you could take it to kilojoules, and then you divide it by the number of moles of substance you dissolved. Now you have a heat of solution. So that heat of solution is a function of the enthalpy of the solution and the enthalpy of the components that did the dissolving. That components would be the solvent and the solute. Now there's a lot more to this, but we're just gonna look at kind of, like I said here, the heat of solution is determined by the mass uh, of the water, because normally we're thinking of water. When we're talking about heat of solution, we're talking about water. So you take a certain mass of water, you know the specific heat of water, you put your solute in there and, and monitor the temperature change. Now, which substance, I mean, now looking at this table here, which substance would we want to use for melting ice? And it would make sense that since these both heat of solution for these guys, lithium chloride and calcium chloride are exothermic, it's a great idea to put that on there because as they dissolve, they actually release heat to the surroundings. Now, you probably are aware that sodium chloride is used to melt ice, and it does that, but it does it by a different functionality. It does it through what's called colligative properties, which actually lowers the freezing point of the water by, by just the fact that sodium chloride is dissolving in it, and that helps melt the ice. Whereas calcium chloride and lithium chloride, they actually work by also colligative properties, so it's like a double whammy. They can give off energy as they dissolve, and they can lower the freezing point of the water based upon their ions and their particles in solution. So using for a cold pack, would it be any one of these? These are all endothermic. Their delta H's are positive. So when something dissolves, you have to kind of think about why it's dissolving or how. So if we have sodium chloride here, solid, sodium chloride is a solid, and when you put it in water, what happens? it dissolves and it makes sodium chloride aqueous. Now this figure, what it's trying to illustrate is that it's really not that simple. I mean, it is true that it does dissolve and that if you measure the temperature, you could get a heat of solution of four kilojoules per mole like we were talking about before. But the goal here was to kind of figure out stepwise why this was occurring. And this is including um, the steps that, remember in our Hess's law and in our indirect method, we we're trying to figure out what the steps were. Now the overall process here in this example is uh, sodium chloride solid being converted to sodium chloride aqueous. Now remember the aqueous solution consists of the ions. So you could even go further and say, well, that's a sodium ion and it is aqueous or it is, and it's a chloride ion, right? Which is aqueous. So that's the process that's occurring. But when something gets hydrated, when these ions get hydrated, 
what's in, in this aqueous solution, what's really being said is that these gaseous ions are becoming hydrated. Now, the reason you might think, why, why would I even look to this gaseous part? And the reason I look there is because when I do a calculation of this, and this heat of solution turns out to be four kilojoules per mole, I'm trying to figure out where that came from. What is this four kilojoules per mole? Is it from this, the, the direct interaction of water on the solid, or is it not? And see, what, what determines this is the lattice energy. There's a lattice energy that's associated with these ionic compounds. And these ionic compounds are held together by electrostatic interactions. So a lattice energy is a measure of the energy that's required to rip them apart from each other into the gaseous state. Again, you might be thinking, why do we care about this? How's the gas coming into it? And it's coming into it because if we don't include it, we don't theoretically, calculationally end up with the four kilojoules per mole. So these heats of hydration have been determined experimentally. So have lattice, a lot of lattice energies have been determined theoretically. And they all work together to explain the numbers that are found like this four kilojoules per mole. That four kilojoules per mole can be theoretically explained by these numbers. This is an experimental number down here. So let's keep going here. So these steps here, this heat of solution is a function, and this heat of solution is this bottom step here, is a function of the ripping apart of those ions and the hydrating of those ions. So these numbers are then a function of each other. Now I wanted you to notice that this is 788, that's this lattice energy U, and it's actually plus a negative number. And that's why you see this negative here, and that's where the four shows up. So as, as lattice energy works with the enthalpy of hydration to create this heat of solution that we see experimentally, we can use then the heat of hydration of sodium chloride to determine, or th then we could break it down to the actual individual ions. And then if we know the, end of the heat of hydration for the individual ions, we can actually determine the enthalpy of solution of unknown substances. So on your fun sheet, this is the last problem on your fun sheet, and it's kind of hefty, is that thinking about that previous slide, um, this the questions I was asking you, think about, I mean, define these things. What is lattice energy and, and what is its sign? The, your book talks about this. What is heat of hydration and what is its sign? Now, this is incorrect. It should be always have. And I took this out. So don't do these parts. What's on this part now is define the heat of hydration and explain what its sign always is and why it has that sign. Now the question is to look at this table 6-5. That table 6-5 we had, I had up earlier, and it was showing the enthalpy of solution of various ionic compounds. And some of them were positive and some of them were negative. Now calcium chloride turned out to be, I have this written down, I think it's negative 84, negative 82.8 is its heat of solution. And that of calcium, of potassium chloride, is about 17, positive 17.2 kilojoules per mole. So what's funny about this, you say, well, why is this one giving off so much energy when it dissolves, and this one's actually absorbing energy when it dissolves? And that's because of this interplay between the, between the lattice energy and the heat of hydration. Now, when cations and anions are hydrated, it's negative, they're exothermic. When, enthalpy, when lattice energies, when you want to rip apart an ionic compound from a solid into its gaseous state, that's always positive. So this interplay between a positive number and a negative number can depend on the magnitude of each number as to what the solution would be. So this heat of solution can be positive or negative. If the, the lattice energy outweighs the heat of hydration, it's going to be positive. If the enthalpy of hydration for the ions outweighs the lattice energy, it could be negative. So that gives you some insight into um, when you see a number like this over here, you see this negative 
if you know that lattice energies are always positive and um, heats of hydration of ions are always negative, then that can give you insight that the heat of hydration of calcium and chloride together must be much larger than the lattice energy of calcium chloride and the similar for the potassium chloride. So it's kind of weird, I know, and it takes a lot of thought and staring at those figures, you know, and saying, oh, I'm ripping apart ions. Oh, I'm hydrating the ions. And that kind of gives you insight to what's going on in the process. So for this next part, I ask you to, again, write chemical equations, you know, illustrating the dissolving of something. And remember when something dissolves in water, I should put in water, um, it becomes aqueous and then it, it can become ions. So I ask you to write the balanced chemical equation. Then I want you to think about the enthalpies. Go to the appendix two and get the enthalpies of formation for the solid and the ions, and you can calculate the enthalpy of the solution. And you should check table, table 6.5, and it should be the same answer. Then the next on this next one, I just thought, well, this would kind of be fun to use this relationship and try to understand it more to determine the heat of hydration of both ions. Because in, in this problem, letter number two here, you're using enthalpies of formation to determine an overall enthalpy of solution. In part three, you're using the enthalpy of solution to determine, and the lattice energy, which you're given here, to determine the enthalpies of hydration of the ions, and it's both ions together. I haven't figured out a way to do each individual ion yet, but there's, I'm sure there's a way. If you know one, you can get the other, but you have to start somewhere type of idea. I have it in a, in a, in a physical chemistry book of mine, uh, and I'm still working on that, but you can figure out the heat of hydration of individual ions. What you guys are going to be calculating in number three here is the heat of hydration for both ions together. So give that a shot, and if you have any questions on that, please uh, send me an email, and we'll work more on that in class. Now, oh, I was wrong. I had one more question here, fun sheet 14, fun sheet number 14. This is a little bit different. It's still heat of solution, but I want you to go to that uh, site again and work on, um, you can you know, work on the problem, or you can work it first where you set up an, a, a, an experiment where you put in 3.50 grams of ammonium nitrate. So you go to solids here and pull up ammonium nitrate, how much you want to put in, which is 3.5 grams. The temperature won't be an issue because there's not a temperature of the solid. Then you go to next and you'll go to the liquids and you'll choose water. And then you can choose how much water you want to put in, in grams. Now up here, it's given 80 milliliters, which is the same as 80 grams. You just put that as grams here. And then you can, you can put in an initial temperature and that initial temperature of the water is given in the problem. And you can choose show specific heat. Now, since it's water, it's gonna be 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then you can show the graph and that's gonna show you a, a picture of, will, it, will the temperature go up? If it goes up, it'll look like something like this. If the temperature goes down, it'll look something like this. And then it will give you a reading of that final temperature of your solution. But you can figure that out. This, is, this experiment here is to test how well your calculation was. It kind of gives you the answer. So what you can do is use the heat of solution of ammonium nitrate, and that's in your textbook, it's in that table, table 6.5. And that number is in uh, kilojoules uh, per mole. So if you know how many grams, you can take that to moles, then you can multiply it by this number to get how many kilojoules that substance will either absorb or give off as it dissolves. Now you have to remember, if it's a positive number, it's going to absorb energy from the water and the water should become colder. If it's a negative number, it's exothermic and it's gonna heat the water up. So when you run your experiment, you will see what happens, but when you do your calculation, you have to determine, is it going to absorb or give off? And if it gives off, you would add that temperature change uh, to, your to your initial temperature and your temperature of your solution would be hotter. But if it's endothermic, then it would be colder. So try to take a peek at that. And if you have any questions, we said we'll go over that, but this experiment kind of gives you the answer. 
uh, but the goal is to figure out how you could calculate it theoretically. So that's all for chapter six. Um, this is all about dissolving. Chapter six fund sheet is a long fund sheet, uh, but there was a lot to chapter six and hopefully those questions will help you understand the content more, uh, more clearly.